that was easy. Hi, so I want to talk about the randomized quick sort algorithm. At this point, you should know what quick sort is. It's a method to sort an array of elements. And what you usually do with quick sort is you look at the list of elements, you pick one of them, and I'm going to call that element the pivot, where I'm going to partition the elements of the array such that the things on the left side are going to be less than the pivot, less than or equal to, it doesn't really matter, and the things on the right are going to be bigger than the pivot. And what we do then is we recursively call quicksort on the blue part and then recursively call it on the red part. Since everything to the left of the pink pivot right here is less than the pivot, everything to the right here is at least the pivot, therefore this pivot is in the right place, and so therefore we don't need to move this pivot anymore, and so therefore when we recursively sort this part and then rec recursively sort this part, let's say in place, therefore we have sorted the whole thing. The problem is that how do we actually pick the pivot? Now, there are ways that we can do this really quickly, such as the median finding algorithm, which we have done on the channel before, but I wanna present a really easy way to randomize the algorithm just by simply choosing a random pivot. So instead of just picking, say, the first element every single time of the array, whatever it is, we're gonna pick a random element in the entire array. It could be unsorted, it does not matter. We just pick one uniformly at random. The problem with the original method was if we pick, let's say, the first element or the last, it doesn't really matter, we could be picking a really bad pivot in the sense that the pivot could have nothing on its left side and everything else on its right side. So effectively, we just placed one element in the right place, whereas here we have, if we chose the pivot luckily, we had roughly half of the things on the left side and half of the things on the right side. Whereas now with a random pivot, we have, again, on average, half of the things on the left side and half of the things on the right side. But here we could, again, make bad choices, right? We could just pick a randomly bad pivot every single time. So what we want to do is we want to analyze what it, on average is the runtime, not a guarantee, but what is the expected runtime, okay? Well, let's see. Let's try to analyze this a little bit. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to look at the runtime T of N, and this is going to be the, the average, so this is not really necessarily the upper bound. This is just to get the flavor of randomized algorithms. Well, what is the runtime here? Well, in order to figure out, okay, this, I got to figure out the random pivot, obviously. And let's say that picking the random pivot takes constant time. So it's, it's not really that big of a deal. Well, now we got to partition the elements into the blue set and the red set, which require us to go through the entire array. And so what we have is going to be some constant, let's call it C1 times N. And so this part is for partitioning. And then we have some business about how to work with the two halves. But we want to analyze this on average. And so what we can do is we can have, let's say, I elements on the left side. And we're going to have, for this reason, N minus 1 minus I over here, because one of them is the pivot, obviously. This I is going to depend on what the pivot's value is with relation to the rest of the array. So we want to analyze this on average. So what we can do then is look over all possible choices of I that could ever arise and just take the average among all of those and then try to see what happens. So what we're gonna do then is, well, how many choices of I are there? Well, it could be nothing. It could be one element over here. It could be two elements. It could be all the way to n minus one elements. It could be n minus one and one on the split. So the way that it's gonna work is I'm gonna have this take the average over all possible of those choices. And this is gonna be the sum from i equals zero to, to it'd be n here of the cost on both sides. So the cost of this side over here is going to be t of i, and the cost over here is going to be t of n minus 1 minus i. So then here, this is going to be t, oops, wrote it wrong, t of i 
plus t of n minus 1 minus i. So then all we have to do is just evaluate this sum, basically. The thing that we can realize here is that these two are kind of symmetric. So if you think about it, if we start with zero things on the left side and everything else on the right side, and we start putting more things on the left side, eventually it's going to start balancing the other way, where we're going to have nothing over on the right side and everything on the left side. So if, in fact, every possible choice of t's over here is going to appear twice, once with this number here and once with this number over here. In fact, this actually should be n minus 1 because of this here. Um, but it's not going to really affect the runtime on the asymptotic amount. Okay, so then here, every single one of these terms appears twice. So if we solve now, we're going to have c1 times n, that's still for a partition. And then here, we're going to have 2 over n, because we're going to pull the 2 out, because every term appears twice, of the sum from i equals 0 to n minus 1 of t of i. So this is a considerably easier, just by noting that this sum is symmetric across the t of i uh, parts. Okay, so then now what we want to do is we want to evaluate the sum. And then once we evaluate the sum, we can combine it with this and we're, everything's hunky-dory. Okay, we're going to use a little bit of calculus right here. So we're going to note that t of n, or I guess t of i, they're, they're exactly the same, it's just different variables, is increasing. And what does this mean? So if I put a, a higher value of i in here, so in other words, I have a bigger array to sort, then that's going to take at least as much runtime as I did before because I have more elements to sort. So this t of i is increasing when i increases. So when i goes up, a funny English sentence, t of i also goes up. And one thing that we can note from that alone is that if we look at the sum from i equals 0 to n minus 1 of t of i, just that sum in there, then this is at most, here's where the calculus part comes in, the integral from 1 to n of, of uh, t of i, t of i di, I guess. So here we can substitute this sum within terms of this integral, okay? Why do we want an integral? <laughs> because um, when you have a bunch of terms that are recursive in this way, it turns out to be a lot harder to evaluate it. it. It is possible. There are methods that allow you to evaluate when you have a sum of t of, of some parameter, but it's a lot harder. And, and actually, it's really hard in this scenario because all of the terms have absolutely nothing in, in common with each other. So like t of 0, then t of 1, then t of 2. We don't know necessarily how those relate to each other. Whereas here, if we have just a single t of i, then we can actually evaluate, evaluate it a lot easier. So then how is that going to work? Unfortunately, we actually need to kind of do a guess and check type approach, where here we can substitute in the corresponding parameter or the corresponding guess of how long this is going to take. So let's make a guess. This is just purely a guess, and then we'll try to refine it later. So let's just guess that t, oops, oops, t of n is approximately c times n log n. Actually, I should say c2. So, so just some constant times n log n. Let's make that guess. It's, it's, I'm not justifying it. This is just purely a guess. Okay, so then let's actually try to substitute it in. Well, you would think, why did you even need the integral in that point? Why don't you just substitute c n log n into here? Well, the thing is that if you have a bunch of sums of logs, then it turns out to not be super easy to evaluate. Whereas with the, the integral, it's way easier to evaluate because you just have the one log in there and it's just way easier. So let's make that guess and then let's try to put it in. So t of n is evaluated to be c1 times n plus 2 over n times the sum, this is just what we defined it from earlier. So this is going to be from 0 up until n minus 1 of t of i. That's just exactly the same as before. But here, now because of this, where the sum is less than the integral, or at most, 
This is going to be at most, we still have the C1N on the front. We still got the 2 over N here because we're just replacing the sum here. And then here we're just going to replace it with the integral from 1 to N of T of I. Well, what is T of I now? T of I is going to be C2 times N log N. So I'm just going to make that sum. So C2 N uh, log N. And then this is going to be DN. So I had to make a change of, of um, variable right here. But then if we evaluate this, what we're going to get is, so if we evaluate this, we can say that this is at most, but we can actually say that it's equal because we have a, a log in there. Then if we evaluate this, we're going to get, if you go through the calculus, the 2 over n still up front, and then what is the integral going to be? It's going to be this. It's going to be C, C2 over 2. Uh, n squared log n minus c2 over uh, times n squared over 4 uh, plus c over 4. Okay, so this is what we, if you evaluate the integral, this is what you're going to get. And let's try to evaluate this. So we have c1n here plus, let's distribute. So the 2s are going to cancel here. One of the n's is going to cancel. So we're going to get C2n log n. And then if we do the subtraction, we're going to get a 2 downstairs. And we're going to have one of the n's cancel. So this is n squared, this is n. So we're going to get a minus C2 times n over 2. And then here, we're going to have 2 times C over 4n. So plus 2C over 4n. So we note that this number right here, this is going to go to zero as n gets big. So this is basically just order one. So that's big O of one. This right here, these two are going to be big O of n. It's just some constant times n minus another constant, this one times n. And so these two are going to evaluate to big O of n. And so this one is going to be the dominant guy. That guy is going to be big O of n log n. So by making that appropriate guess, which I have no justification for it, I'm just guessing it here, that we were actually able to verify that it actually is that runtime, assuming that the smaller parameters run in that runtime than the bigger parameters run in that amount of runtime in expectation. So this is a really quick and dirty proof that randomized quicksort runs in expected n log n time. It's kind of interesting how it works that we had to use a little bit of calculus. There's a, there's a way to get around using the calculus, but I just wanted to show it because it's so cool. We were able to analyze the runtime by looking at the symmetry here between the two t's. And then we use the guess and check method, which is a way that you kind of have to use in some cases for verifying runtimes. So hopefully that was interesting. Leave thoughts about randomized quick sort into the comments down below. As always, please like the video and subscribe to the channel. It really helps us out. There are many other links in the video description if you want to support the channel further. And as always, thanks for watching and I'll see you next time. That was easy. That was easy. That was easy.